So there's this joke, this old classic joke. You probably heard me tell it before. So it's probably not funny anymore, but it turns out to have an awful lot of theology in it. So I keep coming back to it. The old joke goes like this man goes to the psychiatrist and says, Doc, I don't know what to do about my wife. She thinks she's a chicken. And the psychiatrist says, well, have you thought about having her committed? And the man says, well, I would, but I need the eggs. I'm going to wait for you to add your own rim shot there. I, first in, I was first introduced to that joke because it comes at the tail end of a classic comedy, Annie Hall, uh, the Woody Allen movie that won Best Picture of the Year it came out. And even though there's plenty of ways that Woody Allen himself is problematic, that joke and the way it's used in the movie has stuck with me because at the end of this movie about relationships and about one that falls apart even uh, after giving it a really, really uh, hard try, Woody Allen's character tells that joke about the man who says, I'd have my wife committed, but I need the eggs. He, he says, that's us, we human beings in relationships. Why do we keep at it? Why do we keep letting ourselves fall in love? Why do we keep pairing up with people who can be complicated and fussy and frustrating and, and go through the heartache and difficult of it? We should just give up, except, Woody Allen says, we need the eggs. We find something compelling in being in relationship with each other. Now, Woody Allen's character isn't trying to preach a sermon. He's trying to find a funny way to say, well, why do we keep doing this thing that, that frustrates us so much? It gives us so many headaches, except there's something we can't get anywhere else except in relationships of love. As hard and complicated and messy as they are, we keep at it, he says, because we need the eggs. And to be very honest, I find that is awfully close to how we sometimes feel about this faith of ours. That there are an awful lot of reasons why following Jesus and bearing the title Christian and being in the community called church is difficult and messy and complicated and sometimes heartbreaking. Jesus says things that confound us. And then other Christians sometimes are the source of our troubles or difficulties. We, we, we don't agree with one another. Somebody says something mean and nasty on social media, not even about you, but just doesn't seem like a very good example or we find folks who are in diametrically opposed positions and all claiming the banner of being followers of Jesus, Christians, sometimes I know it can feel like, what's the point? Can't we just learn to be good? Can't we just try and be good and believe in hopeful, nice, loving things without all the trappings of, you know, this? Except something keeps pulling us back. To borrow the line of Woody Allen's joke, we could give up on it all, but we need the eggs. That, it turns out, is really, really close to what happens at the end of the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. We, we've been sort of tracking over these recent weeks on and off this long extended speech Jesus gives after having fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Then Jesus sort of turns the camera's focus back onto himself and says, it turns out I'm really like the bread of life. And, and at first, people are like, okay, well, you did just give us a lot of bread and fish, so is that what you're saying, that you're going to keep feeding us? And then Jesus makes it even more difficult to keep listening because he stops talking about making more bread and more fish to feed one hungry crowd. By the time we get to the end of chapter 6 of John's Gospel, Jesus says things that sound outrageous, that sound scandalous, and it costs him followers. In fact, toward the end of chapter 6, Jesus says, just sort of outright comes out and says it, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you don't have life in you. But if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have eternal life. This isn't like the bread your ancestors ate in the wilderness because they ate it and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. And now, John says, he's come and brought this message not just to a hillside where I guess you can say anything you want, but now he's teaching in a synagogue. And he, he doubles down on this language. He says, 
if, if you thought that upset you, this business about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, how about this? What if you were to see the Son of Man, Jesus pointing to himself, ascending to where he was before? It's the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but among you are some who do not believe. Well, what do you know? After saying all these outrageous things, pointing to himself and saying, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want to have life that lasts forever, and then saying, he's been where God the Father is in, in, in time eternal past. This is scandalous stuff. And people give up on Jesus. In verse 66, the narrator says, Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. It's, it's that same scene all over again. Jesus says something that is preposterous and difficult and outrageous. I mean, to, to, to people who grew up with you know, dietary laws saying you're not allowed to eat pork, you're not allowed to, to eat um, you know, a, a, a bacon cheeseburger, and now to have Jesus talking about eating his own flesh and, and drinking his blood, this sounds scandalous. Even if Jesus means something metaphorical or figurative or mystical, doesn't Jesus know that's the kind of thing that's, that's going to be really hard for people to accept whatever he means by it? In our day, this is the moment where a PR expert or, or a spokesperson comes up to the podium and walks back whatever scandalous, outrageous thing the public official has just said, but Jesus doesn't do that. He lays his cards on the table and then doubles down on it, and yeah, it drives some people Away. There are folks like, I, I just can't handle this idea that, that I, I, can, I can take Jesus as interesting religious teacher. I can take him as a rabbi who offers commentary on the Torah. I, I could maybe even take him as a um, you know, teacher of spiritual life lessons, but, but somehow that I'm supposed to be fed by his own life, that's too much. And then for Jesus to say that somehow he's, he's lived, he's been in existence with God, with the Father, before time began, this is, this is difficult stuff for anybody to hear, but especially for Jesus' first century Judean listeners who grew up knowing, knowing you, you don't eat blood, you don't consume human flesh, and you don't talk like that because that's just plain scandalous, and there's only one God. You don't get to talk about somebody else being eternal with God. Jesus is saying all sorts of scandalous things, and some people just say, I can't take that. I'm walking away. But Jesus in her circle of 12, those people Jesus had chosen first, the ones Jesus had drawn to himself, he asked them, do you also want to give up on me? And Peter's answer is as honest and frank and blunt as we need to hear as much as he needed to say it. He goes, well, where else would we go? It's basically a, I need the eggs kind of an answer. It's, Jesus, you've said things that are very, very hard for us to wrap our brains around, but there's nowhere else we can go where we find what is compelling that we find in you. So yeah, Jesus, it's difficult sometimes to understand what you're saying. It's difficult for us to wrap our brains around it. It's, it's difficult because now everybody's going to be looking at us with those weird eyes like you're following that crazy Jesus who talks about eating flesh and drinking blood and ascending to the Father. That, that's too much. We're going to get branded as being the crazies who follow you, Jesus. We can't give up on you because... We need the eggs because we found life in what you say. As mysterious and complicated and difficult and messy as it is, we found something we can't find anywhere else, and it's in you, Jesus. To be honest, I find myself very much in that same place from time to time when life in this institution that we call church is messy and complicated and difficult, and there are days when any one of us wants to just walk away and say, that's it, I'm done, right? Too many fights in congregational life. Too many people wearing the name of Jesus or advertising, using the symbols of Jesus, saying terrible, rotten, mean, nasty, selfish things, and thinking, I, I, I don't want to be associated with that kind of baggage. 
Not long ago, I read a book uh, by an author named Lillian Daniel, and the title of her book captured my attention. She, she titled her book from the uh, mid, middle of the last decade, I'm Tired of Apologizing for a Church I Don't Belong to. I almost feel like if I had nothing else but just that title, I'm glad somebody said that out loud. Sometimes that's how it feels, doesn't it? Sometimes, sometimes we see the reactions of folks who wear the name of Jesus and are mean and cruel or self-centered and think that only their self-interest matters compared to somebody else or our outlandishly mean-spirited or violent or bigoted, and you think, I don't want to be associated with that. Can, 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 there, can there be some way I don't have to deal with that? Or maybe it's just the, the difficulty we have in relating to each other sometimes, frankly. Sometimes it's just difficult being in a congregation where we all have a history, where we all have a story, where we all know each other's open secrets, and sometimes we've lived through disagreements or difficulties together before. Sometimes you just want to say, can't I just bail out on all of it? Except, you need the eggs. You find something in Jesus that is compelling and that we can't get anywhere else. And, and maybe it turns out Jesus' choice to continue to surround himself with this messy, complicated, difficult community, maybe that's part of what his good news is all about. That he gathers people that sometimes feel like more baggage. Because to be honest, there's got to be times that people look at me and go, I don't want to be a Christian, except for the way Steve acts sometimes. And yet Jesus holds on to me and holds on to the other folks I struggle with too. And to be honest too, there are times where Jesus is the one that says things I gotta wrestle with that I have a really, really hard time wrapping my brain around. And I can either just give up and say, well, I would rather not be troubled by something that is beyond my comprehension. Or, I can live with the mystery. I can live with the possibility that Jesus is, is, is bigger and more complicated and more beautiful and, and, and more complex than my mind can wrap itself around and say, instead of just, I'm going to walk away when Jesus says things I don't understand or don't get or can't reconcile with other things in my mind, maybe I'll continue in this relationship. And maybe over time, either I'll learn what Jesus is talking about, or I'll at least discover he keeps giving me life in ways that I can live with the mystery. I can live with the tension. I can live with the difficulties. There's lots of times when we look at terrible things happening in the world and we're left going, Jesus, how come you don't give us a complete, simple, basic explanation for, for why a, a loved one has a cancer diagnosis? Or why a new variant of the virus seems to be taking off in some places, or why so many people have had their lives and their hopes shattered in, say, a place like Afghanistan. And we want answers. And we feel like, Jesus, you should be able to make it clear and explain it. And every day I don't get a note on my pillow saying, well, here, Steve, here's what I'm doing. <laughs> every day there's this added frustration. And, well, I wanted, I wanted a simple answer. How come you didn't give me one, Jesus? And it feels sometimes like Jesus' response. All I can do is vulnerably say back, well, I'm sorry that you don't have the clarity that you would like. Do you want to walk away? Are you going to bail out on me? And it's all I can do to say back, where else would I go? Where else would I go? Because I find in you, Jesus, this life that is compelling and sometimes as difficult as it is to hear what you have to say or sometimes as difficult as it is not to get an answer that I want from you, what you do give me brings me more fully to life. The way you do love me and love people that I have a really hard time getting along with too sometimes brings me to life too. You have the words of eternal life, Jesus. Where else can I go? Why do we keep at it? this thing called the Christian faith? Why do we keep following Jesus, whether because of what Jesus says or because other folks who are on the journey too sometimes frustrate us? I gotta go back to that old joke. It's because we need the eggs. Because we can't help but find ourselves falling in love with Jesus for all the other difficulties that come along with it. He's worth it. Join us this Sunday for more conversation as we talk together, as we study together, as we live together and praise the God together, who as much as God can be frustrating or difficult or mysterious, also brings us more fully to life.
come because, maybe just because you need the eggs. See you Sunday.